and I just figured that it's probably a good time now to talk about oh. So that happened. Welcome back to my channel and today we're going to be talking about Assassin's Creed Valhalla which is the most recent of the Assassin's Creed games. It came out in November and I finally finished it a couple of weeks ago after playing it since launch. So uh, I clocked in 101 hours when I finished the main story so it took me a while but we got there. Um, and I just figured that it's probably a good time now to talk about... Oh. probably a good time to talk about my thoughts on the game because I probably have more thoughts on this than I have had in Assassin's Creed for years. Um, I certainly had thoughts about Odyssey, none of them good. Um, I had thoughts on Origins but I just have a lot more to say about this game because I had a lot more passion for it which meant that the bits that I was disappointed in disappointed me more than a game where I didn't enjoy anything. So um, I just have a lot to talk about and that's what I'm going to do here. Before I start I want to say I know that as a community we like to know that the people that we watch on YouTube when they talk about Assassin's Creed actually know what they're talking about because this is a very divisive fandom, we've all got very different opinions and we like to know that the people that we're listening to do know the franchise and know what they're saying. So I just want to clarify I've played every Assassin's Creed game to date except from the spin-off titles so uh Altair's Chronicles, Bloodlines, Liberation and Chronicles I haven't played although I've watched a full playthrough of all of them so that I know what the story is I just never bought them and played them um I've seen the Assassin's Creed movie I've read most of the comics um I I was big into initiates i've read every piece of information that they ever put out on initiates i love it and i miss it so much and i'm one of those fans that would be considered a lore head someone who just loves the assassin's creed lore and soaks up every tiny piece of information uh my friends kind of treat me as like the assassin's creed encyclopedia because if you need to know a really obscure bit of assassin's creed knowledge likelihood is that i have it stored in my brain somewhere <laughs> My favourite Assassin's Creeds are um, the Ezio collection and I know that's a cliche but there's a reason why they're so popular, it's because they are the best. Uh, I also love Syndicate, I know it's not the most popular game in the world but I loved it, I had such a fun time with it, I just thought it was really fun, like that was it, like I just had so much fun when I played it and I, I still do, I think it's great. Uh, I love the first Assassin's Creed, I replayed it actually just this week and it holds up so well, it is so good and I think it honestly is better in retrospect when you go back and play it and realise just like how good it was to be able to have that kind of social stealth, that Assassin Templar ideology conflict, it's really good, it really holds up. I enjoy Black Flag for the story and I love Edwards. I think he's one of the best characters in the series but I don't enjoy naval combat and that gets me a lot of criticism in the fandom but I just can't take to it. I never could. I don't enjoy having to like shoot other ships with my mortars and stuff. It's just not for me. It's just not the kind of thing that I enjoy. I like climbing up tall buildings and doing air assassinations and you know, blending with monks and trying to stab people from crowds. That's just the way I like to play Assassin's Creed and so sailing my ship around and trying to blow up forts just isn't really my thing. But I still enjoy it as a game. I'm less of a fan of Assassin's Creed 3. Don't really enjoy much about it at all. Um, nah. Uh, I like Rogue. Uh, but it has obviously the same issue as Black Flag and that it's lots of ships and I don't take to it. 
I, uh, I can tolerate Unity in small doses. I enjoyed it a lot to start with and as it went on I just became really exhausted with the whole experience. I loved Origins. Um, it's not my favourite in the world but I love Ancient Egypt and I thought that Bayek was absolutely brilliant. He is one of the best characters we've ever had in this series. He's wonderful and I would love to see more of Bayek because he really does like he's just great. He's just the best. Um, and then uh, I hated Odyssey with every fibre of my being and I'm not going to go into why. Uh, if you want to know how I feel, Laser said a video called Odyssey Broke Me over on his channel and he put it better than I ever could. Um, one of the interesting things is that his video ended with a monologue where he talked about how it's not that he doesn't care about Assassin's Creed because he kept saying like I don't care anymore but it's not that. He said you know it's impossible not to care about something that you dedicated years of your life to. It's just that he no longer hoped for better. And that was kind of, actually no, that was exactly how I felt post Odyssey. I had lost all hope for this series and I was just so disillusioned. Like I love Assassin's Creed so much. It is one of the kind of biggest factors in my life in terms of like, you know, things that are my, f you know, family and friends, you know, like, uh, franchises it's it's a huge part of who I am and it was a, a big part of defining me as a person and my own kind of view of the world um, and view of you know good and evil and morality I think it, it's it's had a really kind of profound impact on me and I just was left completely disillusioned after Odyssey because it just felt like it had fallen so far from what I loved and I had kind of lost all hope that we were ever going to get another Assassin's Creed that felt like Assassin's Creed because it, it it just wasn't happening but then they told us that Darby McDevitt was going to be writing Valhalla and I started to feel hopeful again because Darby is absolutely the best Assassin's Creed writer we have him and uh, Jeffrey Yolham Yolham I've never known how to pronounce his name you know who I mean are like the best writers we've got in this franchise and I felt more positive when it, we found out he was going to be writing it because I was like if anybody can pull this back it's Darby McDevitt so you know please god let it be better so when I went into Odyssey um into Valhalla I wasn't sure what to expect I don't think I had the highest expectations in the world I was, I suppose, uh, cautiously optimistic is probably the right way to put it. I wasn't hoping for the best game in the world, but I wasn't, I wasn't expecting it to be as bad as Odyssey. I was, you know, pretty confident it had to be better. So cautiously optimistic. Um, but my expectations were still lower than they have been in the past because I was so disillusioned. And I suppose when you go into something with low expectations, it has to be doing pretty bad to actually like be worse than you expect. When I went to see Suicide Squad I was expecting the worst thing in the world and came out like actually really happy and really enjoyed it but I feel like if I'd went in expecting a really good film I probably would have been disappointed. I think the only reason I enjoyed it so much is because I expected it to be worse. <laughs> so uh, that does always have an impact on how you view something. If you go into it with it, the thought process that it's going to be awful then it can never be as bad as you think it would be. So I just wanted to um to make, I realise I've been going on for ages, I just wanted to sort of make a foundation for, especially because I'm a new channel um, and I don't have any other Assassin's Creed content on my channel at the moment, there's no reason for you guys to take anything I say seriously when you don't know if I've actually got the like faintest idea what I'm talking about. So um just wanted to, to, to explain my basis for my love of Assassin's Creed and where, kind of what angle um, and what frame of mind I was in going into Valhalla. With that said, let's get into it. I haven't uh, scripted this video, I'm just, I've made a list of topics that I want to discuss and I'm just going to kind of chat off the top of my head. I find that a lot easier than having to sit and try and make coherent thoughts because then I'm just going to drive myself mental whereas here if I just you know sit and, and babble about my thoughts I can edit it into something more coherent later. So my very first topic that we're going to be discussing is 
the story. So, in terms of Eivor's story, I think it mostly is pretty good. I think it's not as personal a journey for Eivor as it is for a character like Ezio or a character like Bayek. You know, it's it's not quite so deep in that way. It's more... What's the word? It, it, it's, just, it's just more surface level, I suppose, than some of the other stories in that the story is about Eivor and her clan trying to set up their domination I, that seems like a really severe word but you know what I mean like they're trying to build their community in England and try and take power in England and and gain control which is what Vikings did that's completely fine but it's less of a personal story for Eivor and more about the things that Eivor encounters and that the game is broken up into specific arcs and not all of those arcs actually have any real personal connection to Eivor. It's more that she goes to a place um, to try and build an alliance with the people of that place and then gets involved in the story when she gets there, which is more kind of of a Connor type of story. I don't like comparing Eivor to Connor, but Connor was always kind of this character who his story was obviously that he wanted to find Charles Lee and get revenge for his whole town burning to the ground when he was a kid but along the way he just kind of got caught up in all of the action that was happening around him he just kind of got drawn into things that didn't have anything to do with his personal journey it was more just that he kept stumbling across things that were happening and then getting involved in them and that's sort of the way that Eivor's story works as well is that she is trying to build a, a strength in England and to do that she needs to form alliances with other shires, other locations and when she gets there there's always something going on. Now this is fine, like I've not got an issue with that, it's the way a lot of open world games work um, where it's more of these kind of like small self-contained stories and I'm not against it I, and some of the stories are really interesting it's just that it does make it feel as if the story isn't quite Eivor's story a lot of the time and it's more of a kind of general story of Viking England <laughs> you know what I mean it's it's not so much of a personal journey for Eivor as much as it is a look at what kind of things were going on in England in the late 800s it's not that I'm not a fan of it it's, it's a, a bit of a change of pace for Assassin's Creed, I would say. It's not what I would have expected going into it, but it's not that I disliked it either. I was mostly happy with it. Eivor's personal story in the game is mostly about her and her brother. That is the kind of defining aspect of her own story, is that her brother Sigurd is the Jarl of their clan. But Sigurd tends to do stupid things and get himself into bother and about, you know, a third of the way into the game he gets captured by the enemies and gets his arm chopped off so that's um you know not the best and Eivor kind of runs into trouble because she ends up sort of taking charge of the clan while Sigurd is gone but then that means that it looks like she's trying to be Jarl and then there's people accusing her of wanting to steal Sigurd's power but she doesn't she just wants to help the clan while he's gone and then she's trying to find him and she gets caught up with all these people that are in the Order of the Ancients and that's really her story is about her relationship with Sigurd and her trying to to help her clan and, and not ruin her relationship with her brother or her you know adoptive brother. In terms of the arcs, there are ones that are better than the others and I think everyone has at least one arc that they have a kind of an aggression towards. For a lot of people it's Essex and I didn't hate Essex but I get why. <laughs> the thing about Valhalla in terms of its story is that the narrative feels really disconnected sometimes because you can do the arcs and a variety of orders. The game doesn't force you to do them in one specific order. 
Now that's a good thing in certain ways because it does give you agency as a player but at the same time it doesn't really matter what order you do them in because you need to do them all so I don't personally really care like about what order I do them in if I'm gonna have to do every arc just give me the right order just tell me what what order these events happened in and I'll do them I don't really need that level of player choice where they're like pick where you want to go next like I don't care if I do Leicestershire or Grant of Redshire first it doesn't actually affect me in any way so just tell me what one to do I would rather the game just gave me the narrative and the right order i hate when i have a game where i don't know if what i'm doing is in the right order because it messes up the narrative like this is me just going off on a tangent but i did jorvik um and then did yurovich shire and then did glowichester shire so in jorvik it was christmas and they were all talking about the fact that it was the yule festival so it was christmas then i went to glowichester shire and it was halloween so there's 10 months in between those two things happening and it clearly has not been 10 months in the game. Now the game takes place over like five years so like it could have been 10 months but it didn't feel like 10 months to me. There was no sign that time had progressed in any way and so the fact that it suddenly was 10 months later when I got to Gloucestershire, even though it was probably only about 10 hours in my time just felt kind of ridiculous and then not long after that we go to Hamptonshire and it's Christmas again and I'm just like I've got no idea what order I'm meant to be doing this in I don't know why time is jumping around so much and that just frustrates me also people have complained that there are certain arcs that spoil other arcs but the game doesn't do anything to prevent you from doing those arcs in that sequence if you do Winchester before Sussex, now in fairness the game has each area leveled so Sussex is a lower level than Winchester so logically you would do Sussex first. The issue was that the game dialogue implies that Sussex is a big main story point so a lot of people thought you were supposed to leave Sussex until later in the story when actually you're not. There's n no reason to do that. But if you do Winchester first, Alfred will mention about how you killed Fulke even though you haven't done it yet because you haven't completed Sussex and the game does nothing to prevent this. If you complete Jorvik and then do Sussex but don't do Jorvikshire and Levina dies in Sussex, it will break the Jorvikshire quest because you need to be able to speak to her and she's dead so she won't spawn because she's not alive. That's stupid. That shouldn't happen. The game should not give you the option to be able to do that. And as many people have pointed out, and this this felt dumb to me because I did the same thing. So Sussex, the whole point is that you're going to rescue Sigurd. And Ranvi tells you that it would be best to make more alliances so you have more people to bring with you to Sussex. And it's true. Depending on how many alliances you've made, more characters will show up. So if you've made more alliances, then the people that you met in those areas will come and help you when you go into battle against Fulke and her people. Whereas if you do less alliances, you won't have as much backup. The issue with that is that it feels kind of dumb because if you're off doing a bunch of other quests, you've just left Sigurd there. And Eivor as a character seems like someone who is quite impulsive. If her brother is trapped somewhere and missing an arm and getting tortured, I'm pretty sure she would go straight to get him regardless of how much backup she had because she's an epic viking warrior. She doesn't need backup, you know? She is the backup. But instead you can just run around England doing a bunch of other stuff including the much reviled Essex arc which involves you basically getting caught up in someone's like marital drama. That's the thing, the Essex arc is predominantly marital drama. It's a guy and his wife who don't want to be married anymore. She decides she's going to leave and go back to France. But because it's seen as like wrong to get divorced, they have to make it seem as if she's been kidnapped so that then he can get together with the woman that he was in love with when he was like a teenager. So while your brother is away getting tortured by the enemy and missing an arm, you're just hanging around playing, you know, Dr. Phil 
with a, a bunch of people in Essex. It, it makes no sense. And someone pointed out that you can do the Vinland arc while Sigurd is trapped with Fulke, meaning that you've probably went off on like a six month voyage to the other side of the Atlantic while your brother's still trapped and you're not doing anything to help him. And that just makes no sense. That shouldn't happen. That shouldn't be the case. We should not have a narrative that allows you to do something that makes so little sense. Like, that doesn't make any sense. But you're allowed to do it. And I really wish that they hadn't done it that way. I wish that they would have made the arcs in a specific order so that the narrative feels solid and doesn't feel so janky because it's, it is, it feels weird. It feels dumb to be doing a bunch of random stuff that doesn't really seem that important when there are actually important things going on elsewhere in the country that you're completely ignoring. I don't, I don't like that. In terms of the arcs themselves, the ones that I really enjoyed the most were the city arcs, so London, Yorvik and Winchester, because they felt like a classic Assassin's Creed where you investigate, you find out who the targets are, and then you go and assassinate them. That, that is Assassin's Creed, and that is what I want in my Assassin's Creed. I don't want epic boss fights, I don't want raiding forts, I just want to be able to assassinate my targets, I just want to do investigations find out stuff about the Templars and then kill them. Is that so much to ask Ubisoft? Um, the other arcs I liked, I really liked the arcs um, with Cheobear because I'll come on to him later. Cheobear is my favourite character. I love him so much. The arcs that I really didn't like, I really didn't like Eurovitshire. I was so bored through the entire of Eurovitshire and I know people are going to be angry at that because that's the one where you get to meet and hang out with Halfdan Ragnarsson. Ragnar San? That makes him sound like an anime character. Haftan Ragnarsson. But I didn't enjoy it at all. I found that whole arc awful. I hated it. I hated all of it. I hated the fact that I'd spent all this time in Jorvik investigating who the bad guy was and then it turned out that everybody was the bad guy. Like, the bad guy was one of four people. And then you get to Jorvikshire and discover that two of the other three of the four were also evil. So then by the end of it, all three of them are dead and there's only one guy left standing. And I'm like, I could have dealt with this in Jorvik. I could have just killed all of them and it would have saved this entire arc from happening. But uh, I didn't like it. I didn't like it at all. Clewichester Shire feels really strange. Um, it's I didn't dislike it, but it does feel, I think by that point in the game, really unnecessary to be running around trick-or-treating and chasing some crazy like witch lady through the woods. It doesn't really feel necessary at that point anymore. Um, my favourite arc in the whole game is Hordefilke, which is in Norway and it's because it relates to the modern day story and I'll come on to that later, but that just made me so happy where I got an actual arc where everything that I did was relevant in the modern day because that is what I loved about Assassin's Creed was that what you did in the past directly influenced what happened in the modern day so that when you were going into the past you knew you were doing it because it was relevant in the modern day and they needed to know this information it's one of the things that makes it really difficult for me and the other games where there is very little modern day because i just don't know why i'm bothering to do anything because i know i'm not doing it to further any sort of purpose in the modern day i'm just exploring a story for no reason and that bugs me whereas here finally it felt like everything i was doing had a meaning and we saw the same location in the modern day that we saw in the historical section and that just makes me really happy because that that is what i want that is what i want i want to be able to take my character to the places that i saw in history in the modern day and go oh my god these things are still here this is awesome it's why I love Monterigione and Brotherhood because you show up and it's it's modern Monterigione and there's cars and street signs and and shops and stuff and you're like oh my god this is this is where Ezio lived but it's it's 2012 and I'm getting really excited but you get my point <laughs> that's what I love about Assassin's Creed and that that is what we need more of please God Ubisoft listen we'll move on now to talk about Eivor. <laughs> So 
so Avar Wolfkist, Avar Varen's daughter, whatever you want to call her, I think is a really interesting character. I actually really enjoyed her. At first I found her kind of annoying just because she seemed incredibly grumpy. Like, <laughs> so grumpy. She seems to just be angry at the world and I was like, if you're just going to continue to moan through this whole game, I am going to get very frustrated. But she did seem to ease up quite quickly and she is definitely like a really caring person. You see the way that she interacts with children, the way that she interacts with the people around England. And she is generally really accepting of everybody. Like she's accepting of Erke and Stowe's relationship. She's accepting of the Anglo-Saxon people she meets, even when she doesn't know if they're going to be accepting of her. She just kind of goes up to people if she sees that they're in trouble and offers to help them, even if she doesn't know if they hate her for being Norse. And I like that about her. I like the fact that she does seem like a genuinely caring person who wants to do right. Even though she's also a viking and spends her life raiding monasteries and killing people, in her daily life when she's not being an epic viking she seems to be a good person and she cares about her settlement, she cares about the people and you can see how much it weighs on her when something bad happens, when they lose someone from their group, you know, how, how hard she takes it because she just genuinely loves all these people and they're her family and I really like that about her. I just really like that she has this big heart and she's loving and caring and friendly. One of the big criticisms that Eivor has is the fact that she doesn't choose to join the Hidden Ones and that disappoints me as well especially because the way that the line is written and Darby has clarified that the way that everyone has interpreted the line isn't actually what he meant and that it was badly worded but unless they're going to patch it out and then like there's nothing you can do right now to fix that but essentially Eivor realizes at the end of the game that living a life where all you're caring about is glory is worthless and that you need everything else you need love you need friendship you need happiness you know a life where all you care about is gaining your glory and getting to Valhalla isn't important. But when she gets back to the settlement to Ravensthorpe, she tells Hytham that the reason she can't join the Hidden Ones is because she craves the glory and it's not, you know, there's no glory in stabbing people from the shadows. You need to be out there, you know, killing people in full view so that everyone showers you with glory and it came across really badly because it seems as if within like the five minutes since she came back from Hordafilke she's completely forgotten everything that she had said that she wanted. Now he clarified that that's not what that line was supposed to mean it was badly worded and it, using the word glory was wrong because it meant it connected back to the Odin thing and that wasn't what he meant it was more that Eivor thinks that it's not right to hide in the sh the shadows and kill people that if you're going to do something you have to do it right and and do it in public you know hide in plain sight isn't what she wants she just wants she wants to be able to to stand up and and have her community be prominent and to rise up the ranks in England and she wants them to be notable and like notable members of society whereas if you become a hidden one your whole life is hiding from society hiding from the world and that's not what she wants and that makes more sense and the thing is I, I think she's right when she says that we fight for different things because there's nothing really in the game that ever implies that Eivor actually understands or wants to understand the Assassin's Creed is more just that she's helping them because it furthers her own ends and so I think if she joined the Hidden Ones at this point it would feel strange and not really particularly satisfying I hope she does join in the future. I would really like to see her become a hidden one in time, but I don't think that her becoming a hidden one at the end of the game would have made a lot of sense. And so I'm not against that decision, but I do understand why, because of that really badly worded line that people didn't take that very well, because it doesn't it doesn't make sense the way that it's written out. It's a really bad bit of writing, but we forgive him. We forgive Darby, you know. You, you've written a lot of lines here, mate. I, I understand. You know, sometimes things slip through the cracks. I'm not angry. It's okay. We're going to move on now to my 
favourite aspect of any Assassin's Creed, which is the modern day story. So first of all, let me just get this out of the way. When I found out that Sean and Rebecca had finally got married and that the thing that I'd been shipping since Assassin's Creed 2 has finally sailed, I almost threw up from happiness. Like, I was screaming, I was jumping around, and I know that makes me sound like a child, but you don't understand how long I have been campaigning for my ship to sail, and it did. So I'm just going to put that right out there right now, that Sean and Rebecca getting married saved 2020 for me. Like, 2020 was a nightmare, still is in 2021, but Sean and Rebecca getting married made it worthwhile having to live through that entire year. Thank you, Darby McDevitt, for finally giving me what I have wanted for so long. You are the true MVP and and I love you. Anywho, um, let's, um, let's get back to the story. <laughs> Genuinely though, Sean and Rebecca are my favourite characters in all of Assassin's Creed. I don't care what you say, like they are my favourites and I have been so pissed off that they got removed back in syndicate and have barely been seen since um like rebecca made one appearance for like two chapters of the tomb of the can novel instead of it three words sean appeared as a fucking amazon echo in the assassin's creed gold audiobook which i i'm not going to talk about that i really liked assassin's creed gold but dear god don't talk to me about the sean ai i just i'm not i'm not discussing it not now not ever but, 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 finally in 2020, they are back in Assassin's Creed Valhalla and I am so happy. And with him, Sean brought back his database, which I've missed so much. The database is really good. I like the fact that it's written in this kind of jokey way, this kind of fun sense of humour that Sean has, where he sort of talks about history and then makes fun of things that he thinks are funny. I love that about him. His database in Syndicate was my absolute favourite because it's just him trashing UK history as an Englishman, which is hysterical to me. And I, I love it. I love his dumb database entries. And I really miss them in Origins and Odyssey because honestly, I would have loved to hear his thoughts on Egyptian mythology and Egyptian history and we didn't get it. And that just depresses me so much. So I was really glad to have him back. Layla is a character that I have never taken to. I've always found her kind of devoid of personality. I saw a thing on TV Tropes that said that Layla is a more fleshed out character than Desmond. And I cannot understand where that person was coming from. I was genuinely tempted to delete the entry and put down the reason as being that it's inaccurate information. <laughs> like, I, I just don't understand how anybody could say that Layla is more fleshed out when Desmond had so much going for him. Like, he had the Desmond's journey where he talked so much about his ideology and about his, like, life growing up in the Assassins. And Layla's just someone who worked at Abstergo and has barely any personality. I don't understand how you can possibly think she's a more fleshed out character than Desmond. Oh god. Anyway, right, never mind. I didn't really like Layla much and I've always found her a bit lackluster as a character. And my favourite thing that ever happened with Layla was when she yeeted Victoria Bobo across the room using a magic st staff because... That is one of the funniest things I have ever seen. It's not meant to be funny. It's meant to be shocking and sad, but it's just hysterical. It's so dumb. And it's pretty much the only thing that I remembered Layla for was that time she yeeted her friend across the room with a magic stick. But she did actually grow on me a lot in Valhalla. She didn't, she still didn't have a huge amount of personality, I don't think, but she felt more real and she felt more like connected to the story she felt like someone who actually gave a shit about what she was doing which is good because I don't get that much from the historical part to actually have a character that's like yeah I give a shit about what we're working on this is important work I'm like yeah yeah thank you Layla someone needs to say it I like their little cabin it frustrates me that they don't seem to have a bathroom or anywhere to sleep like I keep thinking that every time I went back to that cabin I was like where do they sleep they don't even have like 
usually in these places these hideouts they have sleeping bags on the floor but they don't have any and I'm like where did this lot sleep like there's not really a lot of space in here and um, where do they go to the bathroom do they just go and pee in the trees like this is a rental place because there's a thing on the the, the fridge that says that this is like a holiday cottage and I'm like how can you have a holiday cottage without a bedroom and a bathroom now I realize I'm taking this way too seriously this is just the kind of thing that really bugs me <laughs> when I watch stuff I'm like this doesn't make any sense this house has no bathroom <laughs> it just frustrates me I'm just like who is this person running an airbnb without a bathroom what is wrong with you <laughs> um but I like their little cabin. I like the fact that they've got this kind of nice little area and the fact that you can find that area when you go to Vinland in the historical part of the game. I really like that. That's super cool. You can actually see the Cairn stones perched on the edge. I love that. That's super cool. Um, yeah, I just think that's awesome. I think I, that's what I was talking about earlier. I love when I can see things in the modern day that I saw in the historical part of the game and go, yeah, that's the same place. Look how things have changed. Um, you know, history is about evolution, as Sean says. When things become static, it means they're dead. So I like seeing how things have changed over the years. So I, I really like that aspect. In terms of the modern day story... I like it to an extent. The problem is that they basically just rehashed the story from Assassin's Creed 3, which makes me kind of annoyed. I like the fact, what I do like is that the story connects directly back to Desmond and everything that happens in the story in Valhalla is because of Desmond and what he did in Assassin's Creed 3. And that's good because that means that finally Assassin's Creed 3's ending feels like it actually has some weight to it because the Assassin's Creed 3 ending was both rushed and never really followed up on in any particularly engaging way and it just felt as if Desmond had died for the grand total of nothing. To see now that what he did definitely did save the world but had accidentally caused a second solar flare to happen eight years later makes that ending feel more important and like it was like Desmond did a thing and that that I like that part I like and that even though it is rehashing the story from Assassin's Creed 3 I like the fact that it makes that story feel more important in retrospect. I also really love getting to hear Desmond's audio files on the computer. That meant the world to me. I love Desmond Miles. He is one of my favourite characters in this whole series. I don't care what anyone says. He is my boy and I, getting to hear his thoughts was so important to me because he's got such great things to say and that's the thing. Like, that's why I love Desmond's journey. Like say what you want but hearing Nolan North's voice reading out these really emotional statements about like ideology and philosophy, I could listen to that all day. It's just wonderful. And Desmond really does have some great things to say. And I think we all doubted him back in the day because, you know, he was out being like, what's the matter you, Altair? And it's like, yeah, but underneath all that, there is a really like clever person with some really great things to say and we all deserve to listen to him. I also like the fact that Layla's got a letter in her uh, recycle bin in the computer where she's tried to explain to Victoria's parents like what happened to Victoria when she got yeeted across the room by a magic stick and she just gave up and put it in the bin. <laughs> oh poor Layla. I do think the fact that Layla has a mood stabiliser is pushing it a bit far. Like, I realise this is a world where Abstergo have, like, all of the technology you could ever have in the world, but it just seems a bit too, like, X-Men for me at this point. Like, they're like, oh yeah, the mood stabiliser, and I'm like, the fucking what? Shut up. Shut up. No, there's not a fucking mood stabiliser. And this is, no. <laughs> but what, I, I let that one slide, because... As long as it means she's not going to yeet Sean and Rebecca across the room, I don't really care. But I'm just like, what the fuck is a moon stable? Shut up. Uh. <laughs> yeah. Layla getting to go into the Isu temple and like shut off the power thingy was really good. And I loved it. Like I say, Horde of Filky was my favourite. And I loved, loved when she went into the grey and she met the reader. Oh my god, oh my god, as soon as he spoke and he's like, hello Layla, and I'm like, that's Nolan North. 
that's Nolan North's voice. Are you are you kidding me? And then you kept talking, and I'm like, this is Desmond. That's actually Desmond. That's proper Desmond Miles. I'm going to cry. I was so emotional. I was genuinely crying. And then when she's like, oh, like, I need to like help the people that I love. And he goes, yeah, I know the feeling. And I'm like, no, 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 no. And when he, she says about Desmond, he goes, Desmond. And I'm like, no, shut up, shut up, you're Desmond. The great thing about that is that for years we've had this discussion about what the heck the grey is. Because in Black Flag, Juno says, all are here with me in the grey. And, or is it Unity? She says, all are here with me in the grey. And she mentions that Desmond is one of them. And everyone's like, what's the grey? And then there was this big debate about what the grey actually is. Like, it's this, it's the place where Juno lived when she was a digital entity, but what is the grey? And finally, in, um, in Valhalla, we actually get to see what the grey is. And it, it seems to relate back to what happened in Brotherhood with Subject 16. And it's like, was he the grey? Was he the reader back then? Like, I don't know. But, and this whole idea that Desmond was Adam and that Layla is Eve and that's why she's the heir of memories because she was essentially the female Desmond and then these two heroes walk off into this abyss together to save the world I was so emotional and it was like Lasers brought up this really interesting point in their uh, Valhalla spoiler cast on the Four Pillars network where he said about how um back in Brotherhood Juno says that she will follow you through the gates, something like that. And then in Valhalla, Sean says that if Layla doesn't have the staff, she won't make it through the first gate. And it was like, is that because Eve is Layla and Layla was going through the gate? And I was like, if that's true, if they actually went to the trouble of making that subtle a reference, then this is gold. Um, I fucking love it. I love it. I love it. Yeah, the reader was just the best twist we've had in this series for so fucking long. I fucking loved it. Um, uh, in terms of when we get back into the cabin and uh, Topknot is there with his wolf shirt, I don't know what to make of that. I don't, I don't know how I feel about this whole immortal Isu thing. Like, I didn't like it with Cassandra either and she just shows up in like a girl boss suit and hands Layla the staff and then just disintegrates like a moth I don't know but and I like I really don't know how I feel about Bassam and his awful tasting clothes but I think considering we only saw that for like a few minutes I'm hoping I'm dear god I'm hoping that it gets followed up in the DLC because I want to see what the fuck they're going to do with that story um I'm intrigued but yeah, like the modern day in Valhalla is very good and it is the most thorough and and actually meaningful modern day we have had in years and I'm so happy about it. But like I say, you know, we had a really decent modern day in Syndicate, I felt, and none of that got followed up in the games because they relegated the whole story to the comic and we all know how that ended, never speak of it again. Uh, so as much as I'm really excited about the modern day in Valhalla right now, I can't really say if it's if it's a good move until they tell me what they're doing with it. So until we get to see it followed up either in the DLC or in the next game, I can't say for definite that this has been a good move because it's entirely possible that they will just drop the whole thing again and act like it never happened or, you know, put it into another piece of transmedia. It would not surprise me. Uh, so I'm going to be cautiously optimistic on this one as well but in terms of the actual modern day in Valhalla I had such a good time such a good time thank you Ubisoft don't fuck it up okay now that I've talked about story way too much we're going to talk about the gameplay uh the gameplay in Valhalla is very varied there's a lot to do um, a lot of different side content, a lot of really varied missions, not a lot of your standard Assassin's Creed, like, tailing missions, there was, like, two in the whole game, um, there's, obviously, in the cities, you get to, like, investigate your targets, and then you get to assassinate them, the other arcs are a bit different, there's a lot of, like, big boss fights, and kind of smaller things to do, and, uh, yeah, 
the main kind of things in the combat bat are your raids and your assaults, I would say, that are new to Assassin's Creed Valhalla. Raids are when you go into like a monastery with your Vikings and you destroy the place and take all the wealth. Four assaults are usually at the end of an arc when you go to like the big castle where the bad guy lives and you have to make your way through all the barriers. And I had a lot of fun with both of these. Like I think that you know the raiding isn't particularly clever, it's just basically going into a camp in other games but I think the fact that they are much bigger locations and there's various buildings and quite often you have to try and figure out how to get in doors or you have to break through a window. There's a lot of puzzle solving in Valhalla which I really like because I like puzzles. I like having to figure things out in games. I don't want a game to be so easy that I just walk up through a door. I love the fact that there's a lot of like you have to move cargo to find a window and then you shoot your arrow through the window to open the barred door and then you can run around and open the door and sometimes you need to shoot down a ladder and sometimes you need to move like destroy some vases so that you can find a hole in the bottom of the wall to slide through. I like those kind of things and there's a lot of that in here. There's a lot of puzzle solving to get to where you need to go and I really like that. I'm really happy if they keep that in because that that's fun to me. I like puzzles. Give me more puzzles. Puzzles are fun. So many puzzles. Um, the combat system, uh, it feels janky to start with. I'm not gonna lie. I think everyone agrees. But I kind of got used to it after a while. It's not as good as the original combat. I liked being able to have a lot of control over my combat. Like, I liked the fact that, like, I admit that in the original Assassin's Creed, all I do is stand and wait for them to attack me and then counter. So that's not really any different to the way that I play in Valhalla. But I liked the original combat system. It just feels more weighty to me. Whereas this one is a lot of... You basically have your heavy attack, your light attack. You can shoot with arrows. You can use your abilities. That's kind of it. And most of the time, I just stood there and waited to hit them. Like... Or I just pounded on them until I won. Like, yeah. So, and the thing is, once you're leveled up significantly, if you're higher than them, then they go down in like two hits and it's really easy. I don't think the combat is particularly challenging and I don't think that it's, if you're wanting a game, you know, if you're wanting a Dark Souls type experience where fighting the bad guys is difficult, Valhalla is not going to be a good time for you. Unless you just choose not to level up your skill tree in which case you'll be under leveled and then you might have more fun but for me I I don't enjoy like I didn't enjoy the combat enough to care about trying to like make it more difficult I was quite happy to just mow my way through enemies so I just leveled up as quickly as I could and then just plowed through people with my um dual giant uh broadsword what did I have it's like um like I don't think they're hammers, but they're like big, long, double, two-handed axes. And I got the, the dual wielding skill, so I just had a giant axe in both hands and just plowed my way through enemies. I love two-handed weapons. It's the same in Skyrim. I always have a two-handed weapon. Um, it's just, I just love two-handed weapons in games. So once I could have two two-handed weapons, then we were having an absolute riot of a time. I really like the settlement. I'm, um, it's weird. Like I loved building Monteregione in Assassin's Creed 2. I put a lot of effort into that, even though it doesn't really do a huge amount for your game. Like you can't really visit any of the places like you can in Ravensthorpe. But I didn't put any effort into my homestead whatsoever in Assassin's Creed 3, probably because I didn't have any fun in that game and just wanted it to be over. But I love building the settlement in Valhalla. And I like the fact that when you do, like you can, the buildings are mostly all usable. Like they all have a purpose. So like even the ones that just give you a feast buff are really important because that helps a lot when you're doing, like if you're going on to do a difficult mission or like a difficult boss fight. And I like the fact that the char there's a character in all the buildings and they all feel real. You know, you've got like Petra and Wallace who are really nice, who work in the hunter's cabin. There's Tarbin, the baker. There's, um, what's their names like? Oh, what are their names? The the two guys, I've forgotten their names, but the two guys that keep getting into fights and keep coming to Eivor to solve their disputes because they're always arguing. They're like, one of them's like a poet and one of them's a painter and he stole the other guy's horse's tail. 
them. Like, I love it. I love that there's all these really fun characters and it feels like this is a proper town with, like, an actual purpose. Like, it feels... It feels like a real place that you live with, with your real friends and family as opposed to just being somewhere that you come back to for gameplay purposes. Like, this is somewhere you want to come back to because this is your home. And I like that. I really like that. Um, I had a lot of fun and I had a lot of fun seeing it grow throughout the game. Like, that was just awesome. So when I got it up to level 6, I was so happy. And I'm looking forward to getting my young spiking haul when I start river raiding. I'm probably going to do that today. I wanted to do it yesterday and then the game took. By the way, as this is, I know these videos are all so um, out of date by the time they get uploaded to YouTube. It's currently the 18th of February here. So by the time that um, I was going to play it yesterday and then it took three hours to install. By the time it finished installing, I was busy doing other stuff so I didn't get to play it. So we're going to try River Raids today probably and, and get some... New buildings for my, my town, that'll be fun. I was talking about puzzles and there's a lot of puzzles in the world events that I, re I really like that. I love, like I said, I love puzzles. And I really liked having all these little mini games to play that I know for some people they're not interesting and that's completely fine. If you don't want to do cairn stones, you don't have to. This is why this content is optional. But I had a lot of fun doing them and I like games that give me mini games. Like in The Witcher 3, I love Gwent. Gwent is so fun. Like, I I just have so much fun playing Gwent. I love it. And there's other games, you know, like, when I was a kid, right, when I was a little tiny kid and I had Barbie Mystery Detective Cruise for the PS1, you could play Shuffleboard. And you didn't have to play Shuffleboard. It didn't contribute to the story at all. But you could play Shuffleboard on the cruise with the other, um, like, holiday makers. And I would play that for ages. Like, I would just be sitting playing shuffleboard. <laughs> it's like, I just love mini games. When I play Grand Theft Auto V, I spend so much time on the golf course and the tennis course because I just love all these little mini games. So if you give me a, a fun mini game, believe me, I will be there all day. And I love the Cairn Stones. The Standing Stones are really cool. The mushroom things where, like, they usually are, like, sometimes they're enemies, but sometimes they're, like, clever puzzles and you have to try and, like, follow the pattern or like find the door with like the odd one out they're they're quite complicated half the time i've had to look up the answer because i just can't find it but i like having these little puzzle elements and i like that they're just things that you come across in the world so if you want to do them then you can i love orlog i just immediately took to this game and i can't wait for them to bring out the physical version because i really want to teach like my family to play orlog and then we can play it at christmas dinner <laughs> I, I mean this seriously like i want to be able to bring orlog to my family christmas dinner and be like right fam after this is our after dinner game get the pictionary away today we're playing orlog so i really i'm really excited because i i had so much fun playing orlog um, and it'll be good to get to play against another human being instead of a computer AI that hates me and, and keeps ruining my day. One of the things though that I was disappointed in in terms of the gameplay is the social stealth. I was really excited when they said that social stealth was coming back. I like lost my shit at the seeing Eivor getting to sit on a bench which sounds so dumb but it's like She's sitting on a bench. Like, how long has it been since we could sit on a bench in Assassin's Creed? Um, but when you actually get to the game, there are very few points when you ever use the social stealth. Trust me, it's just not necessary. Like, it, it doesn't... The social stealth in, like, Assassin's Creed 1 is really important because if you don't use it, you will suck at the game. Like, it's it's... A really vital part of doing well at the game is to be able to work the social stealth. Whereas it's just not necessary in Valhalla. It's quite easy to just walk into a place and murder everyone and, and it doesn't really like have any consequences. So there's no real point to like trying to be stealthy when it's actually easier to just go in and murder everyone. The only kind of social stealth I really used was hiding in bushes and assassinating people, which was fine and I enjoyed that. But in terms of like blending with crowds or using like groups of, of monks to get through doorways, sitting on benches, 
I didn't really do any of that in the game because there was no need to do so. Every now and then when I was trying to escape a restricted area I would sit on a bench. I probably did that about three or four times in the whole game and I liked the fact that I could. It's just that it's not it's not necessary anymore. It's not it's not as important as we hoped it would be when we saw it in the trailer and I, I really hope that they can bring back the social stealth in a more meaningful way and make it that you kind of have to be able to use it to be good at the game because right now it doesn't feel like you do. The only other thing I wanted to talk about in the gameplay was the variety of enemies. I think the enemies in this game are actually pretty cool and um, they all have different sort of styles of attack and I did feel like without really trying to I was learning as the game went on how to deal with each one of these individuals and how best to to make sure that they didn't kill me like there's some really difficult ones like the pikeman and the skirmisher are the ones I hate the most and I liked being able to fi like kind of figure out how to deal with these enemies now I know that if you go into your database it does tell you how to do it but I didn't pay attention to the instructions in the database I was figuring it out for myself and uh yeah I thought that was really fun so I actually like the variety of enemies in this game I, I think they are interesting and that they they do actually add a lot to the combat the combat isn't very fleshed out and so having a variety of enemies that require different types of attack to get rid of them is a good way to make it feel a bit more weighty when it currently doesn't have a huge amount of weight to it so i like that i like the enemies i would like them to keep that kind of style when and going on next thing I want to talk about is the world design. The world is gorgeous, let's just get that out of the way. Um, it is absolutely stunning. I took so many photo mode photos. Um, like it was just, it's gorgeous. There is a lot of empty space in England and I know that that's been a point of contention because there was an article that said that that was a really good thing and then other people were like how can it possibly be a good thing to just have endless endless fields that you have to ride your horse through when you know you could just make things be closer together and I do agree I don't think that a bigger world is automatically a better world when I played AC1 again it made me so happy to have these cities that are specifically designed for parkour where like it's you can find like the best path to get through the city and like the quickest path to get back to the bureau and you can learn the design of the city and how to get around in the most clever way to avoid detection and how to get um back to like the roof gardens that you can hide in and I miss that I miss having a, a, a big city designed to be able to run around on the rooftops um having a big open world where there's entire expanses of nothing in between the locations is not and I don't think a great plus point it certainly looks pretty but I am just sitting pushing forward on my um, analog stick and making the horse go or telling it to follow road and then scrolling through Twitter and that I don't think is what the, the makers want me to do. It's the same thing that I had with Final Fantasy 15 where like the with the car um, like the car would just you would drive for ages because they wanted you to take in the countryside and I'm like what you don't realize is that I'm not paying the slightest bit of attention to the world right now I am looking at my phone and waiting for you to drive me to where I'm going <laughs> so it's not um, I don't think it's as clever as they think it is but I really like England I really like it's just a it's got some really nice bits the only thing that I complain about is that there are assets that are reused throughout the world and once you notice it, it's really hard not to. There is this particular building that is used as a bathhouse. I can't remember what arc it's in, but one of the arcs, it was used as a bathhouse. And you had to go in to get something out of it. And it was under a square of breakable wood in the floor. And then in another, later on in the game, I came across that exact same building somewhere else. And lo and behold, the thing I was looking for was under the exact same breakable bit of wood in the floor. And I'm like, if you're going to reuse the assets, at least do put the thing that you're looking for in a different place. Because I walked in and knew exactly where I was going because I've already been in this building earlier in a different part of the map. Now, I know it's expensive and I'm not saying don't reuse assets. I get it. I get it. But like there are once you start realizing it, you find that there are these same 
buildings and ruins scattered across the map and it just becomes a bit boring after a while because you're like I swear I've already been here like three times already I've seen this particular ruin already in multiple other places in the map so that's my only real criticism of the world design. Norway is beautiful but it's a struggle I hate the cliffs um the climbing physics in Valhalla are actually really bad they're really clunky um the part that's the thing I didn't talk about in parkour the parkour in Valhalla is terrible like it is some of the worst I've ever played it's so clunky trying to get Eivor to do what you want her to do is so difficult I spent so much time I spent so much try time like trying to jump from one thing to the other and she would like jump off in complete wrong direction and hit the wall or just jump down instead of jumping across to the other wall and the parkour is really bad and it makes it worse because the world is like specifically designed not with parkour in mind so like everything that you try and do and then sometimes it's muscle memory like one time I was like trying to get to a, a thing that was up a wall and I tried to do the wall run and jump to the side because in my head that is a classic Assassin's Creed move but Eivor can't do it and I was like see if this was an old Assassin's Creed I could get to that pillar so easily but I can't because the game doesn't let me and the yeah the parkour is a bit broken and the world design doesn't lend itself to make that parkour any better and the big massive cliffs and Norway and in particularly Asgard make the game so slow because the climbing is really slow and I know that if you climb a massive mountain in real life it's going to take time but this is a video game don't make Eivor take so long when she's climbing up stuff it takes forever it's so frustrating and it doesn't help that the world has got these massive cliffs that are clearly only there so it takes ages to climb them like it's not fun climbing the side of a cliff really slowly especially because when you used to climb like a tower in Assassin's Creed it was a puzzle because you had to find the right handholds to get the character to get up the tower climbing a mountain doesn't require any skill they just go straight up it just takes ages so again I'm pushing forward on the analog stick and checking my phone and waiting for him to get to the top so I'm not I don't think that's a particularly clever way to do parkour or a particularly clever way to do world design and I'm not entirely sure what they thought it was achieving but it's not. In terms of aesthetics Vinland looks absolutely gorgeous it's especially because it's kind of like this summer compared, compared to the kind of autumn winter look of England. I love the fact that a lot of England is autumnal. That I think is super cool it's like the trees are like red, like the leaves are red and there's like wee leaves on the ground. I love that. I love the snowy bits where it's winter. And then in Vinland it's summer and everything's bright and there's loads of foliage. It's gorgeous. Asgard, like the the um, Aurora Borealis and the sky and the, the big um, lightning magic bridge looks gorgeous. The Asgard and the Jotunheim graphics are beautiful, like the actual design is beautiful. And I have my own thoughts on them as arcs, but they look stunning. And the fact that when you come to, to go to Hordafilke and the, well, both the, the history, Eivor's time and Layla's time, you find out that what you saw as being Asgard in Eivor's dreams is actually an Isu temple. And you can see where it comes from. You can see the tower, you can see the bridge, you can see the tree, you can see where this image was inspired from like what it's meant to represent and I think that's really cool that's really interesting so they all look really great and in terms of design of like Isu temples and stuff they all look awesome like the one where you find Excalibur looks so cool so cool I love it I love it I love it, I love it. speaking of Asgard and Jotunheim though let's talk about the fantasy elements the myth elements and the Isu elements because those three things are not the same thing. I don't like Asgard and Jotunheim and I don't want them in my game. Did I enjoy playing them? Jotunheim yes, Asgard no. Um, but like I don't I don't want this in my game. I don't want these 
fantasy, mythology, worlds, and listen, I love mythology, right? Like, I see this shelf right here. These are all my mythology books. That one there is a book that's a box set of three encyclopedias of mythology. Um, they're all King Arthur. There's one there, uh, The Essential Visual History of World Mythology. I love mythology. I just don't want it in my Assassin's Creed game. If you want to make, if Ubisoft want to make a game where we play as Norse gods and run around Asgard and make it a full, like, you know, Valhalla sized game, but set in the mythical Norse realms or the Egyptian myth or Greek myth, whatever. I'm all for them doing that as long as it's not meant to be Assassin's Creed. Just make a Norse mythology game or a Greek mythology game. If you want to make mythology games, make them, but stop making them in Assassin's Creed because that's not where they belong. The Isu are not the Norse gods. The Isu are not the Greek gods. The Isu are not the Roman gods. The Isu are the Isu. They are the first civilization who lived on Earth and created humans to be their slaves until we rose up and took over and they all died. They are not gods. They are only the ones who came before. They literally tell us that in the second game. Stop doing this. Now I know that what Eivor sees in her dream is not the actual Norse. It's a representation um, and it's because that's how she perceives it. You know, like these are the Isu that she's dreaming about, but it's coming to her using the representation that she knows of Norse myth because that's the only way she can understand it. Fine. Still don't want it. Still don't want it. Someone else pointed out about how you can, um, I think it was again, it was on the Four Pillars, it was about how as well as being able to piss off to Vinland while Sigurd's lo lost an arm, you can also just go to the Seer's Hut and get high and go to Asgard and, you know, fight mythical wolves all while <laughs> Sigurd is still missing an arm. And it's like, yeah, it does feel strange. I just don't like it and I don't want it here. I don't... And like I say, I like the fact that it turned out that Asgard was actually a representation of an Isu temple. But I still don't want it to be portrayed like this, especially because um, it makes it imply that everything that happened in mythology was real, when the whole idea is meant to be that myth and, and religion was inspired by those who came before, and that's how we got mythology. Like, it, it's, it's like um, Chinese whispers, so it's these stories that got passed down through the generations and kept get evolving with time which has formed the mythology around these people who actually were not gods they were just those who came before and so trying to make out that it's north mythology doesn't really work and then people come in and complain it's like but you know why haven't they been more authentic and more true to the real mythology story it's like because this isn't real mythology this that's not what this is this isn't norse gods this is the isu this is a, a weird like drug-fueled dream about the isu that's coming to avar in the form of norse mythology it's just so messed up it's so confusing and it doesn't really make sense to anybody because if you're here for an interesting isu story you're not really getting it and if you're here for a norse mythology story then you're not really getting it and i just want them to take this out of the game i want them to remove the the fantasy mythology elements take away the giant like centaurs and the big basilisk snakes and fenrir get rid of it all i don't want it in my assassin's creed game i want assassin's creed if you're gonna have things that are wild and crazy for me to fight they have to be made by isu technology they cannot be made by supernatural bullshit because there is no supernatural bullshit in assassin's creed it's one of the tenets of writing assassin's creed is that everything has to have a scientific explanation there is no magic in this series that wasn't one of the ten commandments for writing assassin's creed so no supernatural bullshit and no drug-fueled dreams stop it just stop it that being said, I really enjoyed the quest where you meet the White Elk, but that's just because it was so dumb that I loved it. But um, 
I can take people getting high off of mushrooms. Like, I can take that. Fly agaric really is, you know, bonkers. And it makes you, you see strange things. So I'm fine with that. Just don't, yeah, stop. Stop everything else. Stop it. In terms of the pieces of Eden and Valhalla, this is probably one of the things that gets me the most. The Four Pillars were talking again about this and about how it feels dumb for there to be so many really significant pieces of Eden scattered across the UK that Eivor can just pick up and strap to her back and then run around with. And, you know, Fishy is currently, when he plays, he's got Excalibur, Mjolnir and Noden's Ark all strapped to the back of Eivor while she runs around England and nobody questions it. And it's true, it feels stupid. The pieces of Eden before, the whole point is that they're really difficult to find. That's why Abstergo don't just show up and take them. But according... Now, yeah, in fairness, this is the year 800 and something, so... Maybe they were easier to find back then, but... Like, the fact that Excalibur is just, like, chilling in a cave and you know like Mjolnir is also just chilling in a cave and Noden's Ark is in like a pile of mud that you can hit with a sword it just it just doesn't make sense and the fact that nobody else questions it doesn't make sense you know you've got a magic sword that shoots bolts of lightning and nobody is concerned by that is dumb that doesn't make sense that's that's a mess and that's not what should be happening if you're going to have pieces of eden they need to be significant and important to the story the way that they've always been and you need to have someone comment on the fact that these things are like pieces of technology that wield insane power and that you can't just go around throwing them willy-nilly like if you've got excalibur and it's some kind of magic eden sword you shouldn't just be swinging that around in the daily life in the middle of like a group of civilians because you don't know what kind of crazy thing that it could do so stop stop it stop that i don't like that i don't like having pieces of eden be so generic like just lying around the world also excalibur because i am a huge king arthur fan um that frustrates me on a whole different level because I'm not even going to get into it. My, just that if you're going to include Excalibur, then you're confirming that King Arthur exists in this world and that opens up a whole other kettle of fish about mythology and legend and I just don't want to even go down that road. <laughs> so let's just move on. One of the things Assassin's Creed Odyssey was criticised for, and it should be, was how bloated it was and how hard it was to grind. I appreciate the fact that Valhalla made it much easier to level up and it didn't feel as if... Well, actually, no. Like, never was I... Un I was never underleveled. Now, in fairness, I was doing a lot of side content as I went along, but I wasn't doing it because I needed to. I wasn't grinding to level up because I was underleveled. I was doing the side content because I was actually enjoying it and having fun in the process. So I appreciate the fact that they've made the side content actually feel worth doing and the fact that most of the time it's quite quick. You know, it's not like you have to do actual quests that involve you, you know, having to, to do a lot of gameplay. It's little things like showing up to a cursed object and shooting it or collecting wealth or um completing a world event which is basically just like a little um i didn't talk about this earlier but world events are basically these just these little tiny events that happen where you do something really simple like help a, a man throw crates of, of his possessions off a cliff or uh get followed around by a really annoying bard or help two guys burn their house down and they take like very little time but they're funny and they're interesting and some of them are like are actually like really good and really engaging and I like them but it means that you're only there for like two minutes and I know that for some people that seems really disappointing and like a waste of time but I like the fact that it means that you're not spending huge amounts of time in the world trying to level up because the things that you need to do to get skill points are really quick. And so if you do need to level up, you're only going to be out picking up side missions for a very short period of time before you're going to be the right level. And I really appreciate that. And I like the fact that they are 
varied. I like the fact that they do things. So like if you're collecting the Roman artifacts that allows you to get things when you get back to your settlement because there's a guy who will take them and then give you rewards for it. So it's not like you're just collecting stuff for the sake of collecting it, it's actually giving you things in return. When you do the puzzles you get skill points and they're most of the time actually quite fun. The, the Standing Stones puzzles have a story which runs between them about Brendan of Clonfart and the you know Cairn puzzles have a um, story about Eivor's childhood. So when you're playing these things they don't feel pointless or like they're just there to bloat the story. They feel like they're actually contributing to the overall narrative and I like that and I like that it doesn't mean that you're spending a huge amount of time trying to grind because you can quite quickly make your way through these things and that's really good in my opinion. <laughs> I just want to talk about the characters like in general like some of my favorite characters the characters in Valhalla feel real and developed and layered and like people I actually care about unlike so many in the the past um Assassin's Creed's where I've just not felt like I care at all a lot of the time um especially in the last few games obviously I loved pretty much every character in the Ezio collection um, and I loved a lot of the characters in Syndicate, like, I never forget Agnes that owned the train, because what a queen. But there were a lot of ca um, characters in other games that I just, I can't remember anybody in Unity apart from Arno, Elise, and, uh, oh my gosh, what's his name? German. I can't remember anyone else, so, you know, sometimes, it's same with, uh, Origins, to be honest, other than Bayek, Aya and their kid, I don't remember anyone in that game. <laughs> so they don't really, the characters don't stay with you, but the characters in Valhalla really have. My favourite character, as I said earlier, was Chaelbear. I loved him. He was such a sweetheart. And I sent Ivar Ragnarsson to the fires of Helheim. And I hope that he rots, because how fucking dare he. My friend was like, oh, I love Ivar, and I'm like, I never want to hear that name again. He took Chia Bear, and nah, fuck him. So I hate Ivar, but as a villain, he's very memorable. I mean, as much as I hate him, he is definitely one of the more memorable villains we've had for the first time in a long time. Uh, and I love Uba. Uba was cool. I'm still annoyed that he died at the end. Um, Ever Hamptonshire was the worst. Hamptonshire just was like, haha, you like the characters in Valhalla? Hold on till we kill all of them. Enjoy your slow pain. Um, I didn't like Halfdan so much just because that arc was boring, but whatever. My other favourite character, after I lost Chaelbear, I sort of replaced him with Hunwald. I loved Hunwald and um and then the game decided, haha, you you thought you could replace Chaelbear? What if we kill Hunwald too? And then I had to go back and tell his girlfriend, Swamboro, that he was dead. And I was just like, I hate this game. <laughs> I loved Hunwald. Sigurd is a pain in the arse, but I'm glad that he mellowed out by the end because I didn't shag his wife. So he was happy. Basim, uh, I hate Basim so much. But like, he's really entertaining to watch. Like, I hate him and I want to punch him in the face. But also I would miss him if he weren't there. But if he ever calls Rebecca my dear again, I am going to kick him off of a cliff. Like, I might hate Odyssey, but I can do a Spartan kick if I want to. I love Hytham. Hytham is a cutie. Um, I'm glad that he didn't die. I was really worried about him. Uh, I love Hytham. I hope he sticks around. I hope we get to see more of him in the future. I hope he doesn't go back to his brotherhood too soon because I think he's cool. I'm not as big a fan of Ranby as a lot of people are. I, I didn't think she was that well developed, but I mean, I like her and I did end up getting together with her at the end of the game once her and Sigurd split up. But, um, I don't know, she's not my favourite, but like, I like her. I really liked Bridget, the character who is speaking in. I am going to guess that it's Cornish, but I don't know. The one that you can't understand a word she's saying. I thought it was Cornish, but I, I don't necessarily know that it was. But um, 
I really liked her. I liked Sona. I liked Hyor and Lavina. Um, I actually really liked Faravid and was hoping that Eivor could romance him until he turned out to be evil and I had to kill him, so that was unfortunate. Because I, I thought he was super hot. <laughs> but yeah, there's loads of characters. I love Petra. I love Tarbin. Um, I like uh, the seer whose names went out of my head. Loads of the characters that we meet around the country are just really interesting. Uh, Rolo, he's cool. Stone and Erke, I love them. They are so cute. They are the best. There's there's so many like really oh what's his face um Vili from Snotting I'm sure I really liked him yeah there are so many characters to like in Valhalla and I'm really happy because the past few games I haven't really liked any of the characters that much um other than Bayek so it was really good to have a bunch of characters that I actually like for once uh thanks Ubisoft you did a thing right. Assassin's Creed lore. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> as someone who loves the lore of Assassin's Creed, Valhalla was a difficult experience because it doesn't really know what it's doing with its lore. I obviously had a bunch of stuff in the laptop and and like the modern day in the cabin and stuff. That was all great. Really enjoyed it. I love the fact that we've got a new Isu language and that Access the Animus managed to actually translate it and we now know what the Isu alphabet is and we can read their writings which is fascinating and I think that's wonderful but overall the Assassin's Creed lore in Valhalla is a bit there's not really much to go on here we have the hidden bureaus which are awesome and I really like finding them and I like getting to like read their history and stuff when we get to the bureaus. We've got Hytham and Basim who are both hidden ones. Um, and we find out more about the Order of the Ancients and I really enjoyed at the end. I haven't talked about Alfred but I think Alfred was wonderful. I love the fact that at the end we find out that he is the one who wanted you to destroy the Order of the Ancients because he hates them and he hates their ideology and he thinks that they're all like because we find out that the Order of the Ancients were essentially more like the instruments of the First Will, a group that's, that believed and followed the Isu, whereas the Templars are were, were originally a Christian denomination who fought for, you know, Christian... I don't want to say supremacy, but, you know, like the Knights Templar. We know who the historical Knights Templar were. And how they kind of evolved into being more atheistic and not believing in a higher power but just wanting control over everyone's free will and you know unite everybody in the new world order blah 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 blah. I really liked getting to learn all of that I thought Alfred was really interesting as a character especially as like a Templar Grandmaster and we find out that he's actually he's like the anti-Almalim instead of like a, a assassin who turned out to be a Templar we've got like a Templar who turned out to be just a regular guy who didn't want anything to do with it and he at the end basically says that he's going to create a new order to follow the order of the ancients which means that Eivor and you as the player kind of accidentally caused the creation of the Templars who have done far more destruction in the years since than the order of the ancients ever did so whoops <laughs> Well done, you made up Stergo. Yay, go Eivor. But I liked all of that and I liked getting to see the way that the Order of the Ancients work and about finding out more about the Hidden Ones, especially because we didn't get much more information on the Hidden Ones after that DLC from Origins. So getting to see more about the Hidden Ones and how they evolved from being what ba uh, Bayek created them to be to becoming the Assassin Brotherhood that we know today and that we've known through the other games was really interesting. I enjoyed that a lot. I loved getting that letter from Bayek at the end at Rada's um, shop. Loved it. So good. So good. But the, the thing that lets it all down is the fact that none of it actually carries any weight in the narrative. Everything involving the assassins, the hidden ones, the Templars, the Order of the Ancients 
is really only there for the benefit of the player because Eivor doesn't understand any of it, nor does she particularly care. The things that she reads in um, Alfred's study, she just basically goes like, what does any of this mean? And it's like, what do you mean, what does it mean? Have you learned nothing through this whole game? But she hasn't because she doesn't really care. When she goes into the Hidden Ones Bureau, she doesn't even acknowledge the fact that that's what they are. Even though she knows who the Hidden Ones are, she has two of them living in her settlement, but she doesn't acknowledge anything to do with the Hidden Ones when she goes to the Hidden Ones Bureaus because it doesn't matter to her. When she finds, you know, Isu artifacts, they don't mean anything to her because she doesn't know anything about them. When she reads the Codex and reads the, the notes from the, the old Templar um, assassin mentors, it doesn't mean anything to her because she doesn't know or care about the Hidden Ones. When she learns more about the Order of the Ancients, it doesn't really matter to her. All she cares about is getting rid of them so that she can gain more power over England. She doesn't actually care about the philosophy or the ideology of the Order or what they stand for. That's not important to her either. And, you know, when at the end, when she reads that letter from Bayek, like, Reda, Reda literally says, like, it's written in whatever language you won't be able to read it. So she goes over and stands and stares at a piece of paper that she can't read for like five minutes while Bayek reads his story. And you know that she doesn't understand a word of it. None of it means anything to her. And the fact that you're playing a game as a character who doesn't know, understand or care about the Hidden Ones, Assassins, Templars, Order of the Ancients, any of it. She doesn't care about the fundamental conflict that defines this entire series is really uncomfortable because it means that everything that you're encountering is only there for essentially player fan service and not to actually further the story because it can't further a story where the character doesn't understand any of it. Now it all adds to what we know about the lore and that's great and I'm happy that we have these new pieces of information. I just wish that it actually meant something within the story and that it had some weight for the character that we're playing as and this will always be a problem as long as we keep getting Assassin's Creed where our protagonist is not an assassin. We need to have a game where the protagonist is an actual assassin or at least has an interest in becoming an assassin and joining the, or the Brotherhood instead of someone who's on completely on the outside and doesn't actually care about anything that she discovers throughout the game because it just makes it feel really disjointed. And that is bothersome in an Assassin's Creed title. <laughs> That's not great. I've talked a lot about the issues that I've had in the game, but I just thought I would wrap up just the things that bothered me. I don't like the fact that a lot of the lore and a lot of the narrative doesn't feel impactful to the character. I don't like the fact that it doesn't really feel like it's got any payoff and that even though this character is going through all of these things and learning all of this information, none of it really seems to actually stick with her or mean anything to her. It's kind of... It's weird and it's unsettling and I don't like it. I just wish that she actually gave a shit about what she she's learning and that it actually felt like it was relevant to the character and not just the player. Because you do have to wonder why is Eivor going into all of these hidden one bureaus if she doesn't actually care? Why is she standing staring at a piece of paper she can't read if she doesn't care and can't read it? Like it doesn't make any sense and I don't like that. I don't like the fact that some of the arcs feel really pointless and that they are placed in the game in places that they don't really make sense. There are entire arcs that have absolutely nothing to do with the main story and it doesn't really feel like it makes a lot of sense to have to complete Essex or Gloucester Shire when they don't contribute to the actual story of the game, the narrative involving Eivor and Sigurd and the Order of the Ancients and stuff. Um, and they're still fun, I just don't think it makes sense to have them be these like actual fundamental parts that you have to complete to finish the story when all they seem to do is slow down the narrative. It makes it feel longer than it needs to be. The story does feel unfinished. A lot of people have brought that up and I suppose it probably is. I'm assuming it's going to get followed up in the DLC. But when you get to the end of the game, 
once you complete the Tamtonshire and defeated the Order of the Ancients, the game essentially just stops. Like the big climax is really in Hordefilke, but that's not the end of the game. You've still got Hamptonshire and the Order to complete after that, and it does feel as if you've had this really big epic conclusion, and then you just kind of have to do a bunch of other stuff, which then just slowly pitters out, and then you're just left with nothing to do. And I don't like that. I just don't like when a game doesn't have a very definite conclusion. Um, you know, like after Holderfolke, you come back and they all, Eivor becomes the Jarl and they all sing that song. No hearken ye in Hall of Kings. Like that is really emotional and I had like tears in my eyes. But then it's like, okay, now let's go to Hamptonshire. And I'm like, but now I, I feel like I finished and now we're just doing more stuff. I, and uh, I kind of wish the game had a more fitting conclusion. Um, the other issue is the fact that the game is very buggy. I didn't really encounter a lot of bugs. I had some, the awful Yule Festival drunk Eivor bug messed with my motion sickness so badly. I get really severe motion sickness. Um, it's, it's a problem. It's always been a problem. Uh, you know, and actual vehicles and when playing video games it's why I can't really play first person shooters because they make me feel sick um but every time I turn on the game it started making me feel ill because Eivor was like just you know drunk as fuck and that wasn't great I had a bug once where I tried to fast travel and instead of traveling I ended up back at the same sync point I tried to travel from but all the textures were gone and everything looked as if it was rendered in a ps1 it looked like Tomb Raider 1 textures it was bad um you know i have the bug where people's mouths don't move when they talk but i never had anything that was game breaking but i know that a lot of people did and i know it's easy for people to say well my game didn't have any bugs so i don't believe that your game actually has bugs but no there were so many game breaking bugs reported like giving your medallions to hide them too early means you couldn't trigger the end of the game where you find out who the final Templar is. In the absence of an elder man was glitched where if you went into the building and looted it before the gameplay quest, it meant that the quest wouldn't work and you got completely stuck because without being able to complete that arc, you can't complete the game. There were loads of things like this where certain events wouldn't trigger or certain things just didn't work or doors didn't open or keys didn't spawn or characters didn't spawn and it meant that you couldn't complete the game and actually a lot of these still haven't been fixed. I'm pretty sure in an absence of an elder man hasn't actually been corrected yet and I, from what I can tell it looks like Ubisoft really don't know how that happened and they don't really know how to fix it either considering once you've already done that and looted the thing that you weren't meant to loot I don't actually know if there's any way for them to code it so that it can fix that because it, by that point the game has sort of accepted that it's broken it can't pathfind its way back from that and that's not good you know and I realize I completely understand that you know even when you're QA testing a game it is so easy to miss things for things to just not happen and I've seen ones before where there was one thing where Hytham wouldn't get in the boat and sail across the water with you early on in the game and the devs actually said that in their testing and the office they couldn't get it to replicate what people were talking about. They were saying, you know, they were trying to do the quest and none of them were getting the bug that the fans were getting and it's really hard for them to patch out a bug that they can't see and they can't replicate because they can't figure out what's wrong with it and I completely understand that. And if nobody in the testing stage ever looted the castle from in the absence of an elder man before the quest, then they would never know that that was a thing that would happen. So it, it's not... I understand that trying to test every single eventuality in a game is incredibly difficult, but there are a lot of instances of this in the game, and that's just not good. We shouldn't have so many game-breaking bugs that force people to have to repeat the whole game. We definitely shouldn't have the bug where people's save data keeps getting corrupted. That happens all the time and it's happened to people over a hundred hours into the game. No one wants to repeat over a hundred hours of gameplay because their save got corrupted. 
And it's one thing if it's just your console, but it's happening to loads of people. It actually happened to me early on, but that was back before they patched it and they managed to put out a fix that corrected people's corrupted save data. So mine ended up being fixed and I could keep on playing. I was only actually five hours into the game at the time, so if I'd had to restart it, I would have been fine, I would have accepted it. But, you know, for people's saves to get corrupted over a hundred hours in is just not, that's not okay. That's not okay. So I'm not a fan of that. The other big issue I have is, as I said earlier, it's just the fact that there isn't enough Assassin's Creed here. And we're stuck in this limbo. And this is not Valhalla's fault. This is the fault of the series direction and the Ubisoft executive's opinion on what an Assassin's Creed should be these days. It doesn't have enough Assassin's Creed elements in it to make it fully feel like an Assassin's Creed game, but it also has too many in it for it not to be Assassin's Creed. But the problem is that it's like, and I'm going to make up a term here, but it's really, I think, the best way to describe it. It's Creed baiting. You know, you show up, if you're an Assassin's Creed fan from the beginning, and you show up to this new game hoping that there will be some kind of Assassin's Creed lore and elements there, you still buy the game because you hope that you're going to be able to get something from it. And as long as Ubisoft are getting the money, they're happy. Whereas if you just want an epic Viking simulator, you're going to buy the game whether it says Assassin's Creed on the front or not. So we end up in this horrible situation where Ubisoft are making a ton of money. And at the end of the day, that's all they care about is how much money they make and how much profit they can get and their goddamn microtransactions. Let's not even get into that. And so they don't care if it doesn't feel quite like an Assassin's Creed game because they know that the saddles like me will keep buying them anyway in the hopes that there's something in them that is worthwhile. In fairness, I never bought Odyssey. I actually won a copy of Odyssey in a Facebook competition. So I'm glad and at least I know that the one game in the series that I truly hate, I didn't give them any money for. <laughs> they don't have my money for Odyssey and that makes me happy. But they do have my money for Valhalla and they have my money for every other game in the series. And that is a shame. That your Assassin's Creed game doesn't feel like anything actually matters and it doesn't feel like an Assassin's Creed a lot of the time. And we need to fix that or stop making Assassin's Creeds. Take your pick. Because at this point, I don't think I care either way. Either make the Assassin's Creeds feel like Assassin's Creeds or just make Epic History Simulator and take Assassin's Creed off the front of the box. It's really not necessary to try and bait us into buying games that aren't for us anymore. Stop it. Stop it. <laughs> Stop it, Ubisoft. So my overall opinion of the game, as much as I just sat there and criticised it, I genuinely loved Valhalla. I've played it for over a hundred hours. I've had a really good time with it. I've cleared huge amounts, of, like I've cleared entire arcs, um, entire shires of all of their side content. I've got Excalibur, uh, you know, like I've, I've put a lot of effort into this game and I did really enjoy it. I just wish that they would take the Assassin's Creed element more seriously and I wish they would stop acting as if our, like, the people who have been playing the games since the beginning don't deserve to at least get, you know, the story that we invested all this money into. You know, imagine if you, like, bought six Harry Potter books and then J.K. Rowling just turned around at the end and said she wasn't making the seventh. You know what I mean? Now, like, I know J.K. Rowling's not really someone we want to talk about, but you know what I mean? When you've got a saga, like, a, a story that's supposed to continue and then they just turn around and go, well, what if we just didn't tell you the end of the story? What if we just didn't bother finishing it? How would you feel? It's like, no, don't do that. And that's kind of how it feels. It's like we put a lot of money into this series over the years and they don't really want to, you know, pay that back by actually giving us the story or at least concluding it. Like, if you want to stop making Assassin's Creeds and just make epic history games, then just make a game with an Assassin's Creed story that concludes the series. I don't care how you do it, just end the, so the story and then you can move on and we can all move on with our lives. But we can't because we're stuck in limbo, hoping and praying that maybe the next game will be better 
and it never is and it's just an, an epic cycle of sadness for the entire community but i did enjoy valhalla and what i hope is that the story gets continued in the dlc i hope we get to find out more about basim being a modern day character i hope we get to see Avar join the Hidden Ones. I hope we get more character development and more modern day and more story. And I hope we get to meet new characters. And I hope that all of this, all of the things in Valhalla that didn't feel like they added to anything, I hope they maybe get a payoff in the DLC. That's what I really hope. But I suppose we'll just have to wait and see. For now, I'm gonna go get some lunch and maybe fire up River Raids and see what that's all about. See those foreign supplies that I've been hearing so much about. Until next time, thank you for joining me and do remember that no matter what Ubisoft say, nothing is true, everything is permitted. Thank you for watching.